Latin for truth, and we want to seek truth together as we ask life's hardest questions and explore our deepest beliefs. We have come together tonight to consider what is happiness and what is the good life. Before we begin, we ask that you take out your phones, go to slido.com, and enter the event code USC Veritas in this lovely corner over here. We'll be using Slido to ask questions to our speakers and collect feedback tonight. And so this will be a very interactive forum, so we appreciate your participation in advance. Our hope tonight is that this event serves as a starting point to explore and test our worldviews together. And we would love if USC grew as a place where we could foster a culture of honest consideration and respect with people who want to introduce our moderator. is a very special person, Professor Karen Dubner, uh, who is a historian, received her PhD from USC, and is the academic director of the Sydney Harmon Academy for Polymathic Study. And she has put in so much thought and time. We've talked about this like, event for, I don't know, something like a couple weeks now, but every time I talk to her, she's been thinking about it and thinking about you guys and what would be best for you, uh, especially as a moderator, that's like what she said was her goal. Just pretty amazing. So you have somebody who's on your team here who wants to participate in an amazing conversation. Um, so please give it up for her. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then she's going to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Quincy, for that kind introduction. So I am reading something that Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, our speakers. First, Dr. Satyan Davidos, Fletcher, Chone, Fletcher Jones Chair, not the car company, but another Fletcher Jones we found out tonight, Chair and Professor of Mathematics at the University of San Diego. Before arriving at USD in 2016, Satyan Davidos was a professor of mathematics at Williams College since 2002 along with holding visiting positions at Ohio State, UC Berkeley, the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute, Harvey Mudd, Université de Nice, and Stanford. Did I say that right? <laughs> <laughs> um, Devados is a recipient of two national teaching awards from the Mathematical Association of America, as well as an inaugural fellow of the American Mathematical Society with support over the years from the Mellon Foundation, the National Science Foundation, the Whitting Fellowship, DARPA, and the John Templeton Foundation. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Satyan Devidas. for several years, so it's it's my task to introduce to you Dr. Varun Soni, Dean of Religious Life and Spiritual Life and Vice Provost for Campus Wellness and Crisis Prevention here at USC. Thank you for being all those things for us. Dean Soni, yes. Dean Soni received his BA in Religion from Tufts University, where he also earned an Asian Studies minor and completed the program in Peace and Justice Studies. So he's a polymath. <laughs> I can say that with authority. <laughs> he subsequently received his MTS degree from Harvard Divinity School and his MA degree through the Department of Religious Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. He went on to receive his JD degree from University of California, Los Angeles, Woo. <laughs> School of Law. <laughs> he earned his PhD through the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Cape Town. Dean Sony is currently a University Fellow at USC's Annenberg Center on uh, Public Diplomacy and an adjunct professor at the USC School of Religion. Born in India, and raised in Southern California. He has a family on five continents, and I don't think the other two you can actually inhabit, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and they collectively represent every major religious tradition in the world. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Vernon Sony. So I just have a few opening thoughts. 
talks about uh, tonight that, as Quincy said, I've been thinking about deeply the last couple weeks since charged with this um, task of being moderator. But these are thoughts that I've actually had most of my life. So my spirit, I guess my spiritual journey might uh, probably began when I was nine. So the, 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 the question of the good life, which the great thinkers, great ancients, and all the way up to the current is something that um, is really uh, central to who I am. But I'll tell you right now, if I wasn't up here, I'd be sitting next to you. I'd be out there listening to these folks because these are these are so critical to our and, and central to who we are as humans to ask these questions. It's not that we have the answers, but to be on that path together. We're all in this together, whatever faith, Whatever principle or or uh, system that you uh, embrace, you're here because you're asking these questions too, and we're on this journey together. And that that really brings me joy to be in this this space and time with you. Um, in my kind of research for this uh, event, I I I thought what Socrates said through Plato was really relevant. The unexamined life is not a life worth living. It's kind of the negative side of what we're doing here. <laughs> but then I uh, recalled David in the Psalms. He reflects on his life. He examined his life uh, about, almost like 700 years earlier than Socrates. And I just want to read what he wrote. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So we're joining a great uh, community that goes back millennia upon millennia. <laughs> and uh, kudos to you for taking your time out to be here tonight and to engage us. And your thoughts, because I know when I was 21, I had some pretty deep thoughts, and, and no deeper now, it's just different, and life behind them, behind my thoughts now, but I personally value, and I know we both do here, what you have to say, so we're going to leave a lot of time for you to express your thoughts and, and positions, and, and every position and thought is valid in this room. So with that, we'll uh, bring, I don't know who's going first, but Setian, you're coming up, so let's welcome Setian, and thank you. And Maroon I've known for at least over five years, and he's one of my favorite humans in the world. So I am thrilled to be hanging out uh, with these guys up here. And I want to thank Veritas for inviting me. I, I was kind of surprised because the title of this is about happiness, and um, I was surprised by that for a mathematician to be invited to talk about happiness. <laughs> Especially because math is the cause of so much unhappiness uh, for so many students uh, of mine. Um, and we've this notion of unhappiness about math even extends to adults. You know, people I don't even know, the first time I meet them, when they find out I'm a mathematician, they always start by saying, Father, forgive me. Father, forgive me for I don't understand trigonometry. Father, forgive me for I stopped at calculus and I didn't want to go on. You know, if I'm talking to most people and I ask them, hey, do you remember the last history class you took in college? You know, talking to some adults and they're like, um, I don't know, was it uh, Japan, something like, or was it World War II? I don't know. Like, do you remember the last English class you took? It's, I think it was Shakespeare, or the sonnets, or Beowulf, I don't know. Say, do you remember the last math class? Oh, dude, totally remember the last math class. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the day I took the final, and I never won. <laughs> so, here I am, talking about happiness. So, uh, <laughs> so, you know, I grew up in the south side of India, and, and yet I'm here. Uh, I'm here in America, in 21st century America, in the west coast, in Southern California, and I'm drinking 
whether I want to or not, the cultural Kool-Aid uh, that's in the air, right? That's that's going through our through our blood, and and that Kool-Aid is asking us and telling us like, what is it that you want to be happy for? And there are these notions, these classic notions of what makes us happy, right? There's issues of power. You know, we just heard this week about uh, Harvey Weinstein's case about whoever has power has authority they can get away with what they want, and they can kind of get what they want. Um, the consequences of all that. You, you can talk about issues of fame, you know. Dude, if I had just a thousand more followers, mm -hmm. right? Ten thousand more, that would that would get what I want. Maybe issues of knowledge. Look, you're you're an SC. This is one of the greatest institutions of knowledge in, in the world right now. And uh, and you could think, if I make summa cum laude, if I get into the law school I want, if I can finish that grad degree, then I would have that name. You know, like you we have this long list of recognitions that we're read up here, right? It's like, is that what it is? Like, is that the great life, is to have that long list behind your name? Or is it money? You know, with money, you can go to the cool cool places in LA and take pictures of food. Um, <laughs> buy the car you want. Um, you know, David Foster Wallace, this great writer, um, he wrote the following words, and he's talked about money in particular, but he said, if you worship money, and what he means by worship is if you pour your heart into it, if you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. And he talked about the same words for power and for fame and for knowledge. It doesn't satisfy. You know, if you actually think about the people who have had these things and who kind of made the good life here, you, you realize it's really rare for those people to actually have a good life. Most of those lives that you know who have incredible power, incredible money, incredible fame, their lives, there's a lot of brokenness in their lives and with their families. There's the longing, there's addictions, there's these bigger things that doesn't seem to lend to the right things. Let me just start by giving a little bit of advice. I think y'all are too good to pursue happiness. I think it's not actually worthy of your effort. It, you're better than this. Uh, let me tell you what you should be doing. I think you should all be making a cake. I, I really encourage you all to like, go and go home and make a cake. Like some of you, like my wife, who's like psychotically anal and nerdy, she's not listening to this, but you know, like, when you're making a cake, she's like, mmm, quarter tablespoon, right? Like you're like mixing these ingredients properly. And you make awesome cakes. Good for you. And if you make a cake, shit, your cake's gonna suck. And then you share that, and you'll make it anyway. <laughs> and that's actually worthy of your time to like make a cake with your hands, make friends, make enemies. That's actually worthy of your time. You know, if you ask me, finding the good life, it's actually not for me based on happiness, actually. For me, finding the good life is based on knowing what is real. I just want to know what's real. Like, what's really out there that's real. You know, if I look at the hood of the world, like, what kind of reality do I see under there? I, that's what excites me. Right? And once I got that down, then I could figure out happiness down the line. What's real? Now, unfortunately, here's the problem, though. You see, Matt is not equipped to deal with that stuff. Let me, let me give you a snapshot of what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> now, on the left, here's, here's like a, here's a little contest. On the left, over here, is a page from a book in quantum mechanics, all right? And, uh, and it has equations, symbols, exponential functions, um, <coughs> Most of you are getting repulsed at this point, right? Some of you are getting turned on. And, and we'll talk about those a few later, right? But um, over here, about page on Columbia, on the right, you have a page from probably one of my favorite books, if not my favorite book in the world, which is Beowulf. And my question is, which is harder? Which one of these texts is actually harder? Like, which deals with deeper things? And you might think that this is symbolic and it feels like you can't read it, whereas you have words like mighty and judgment and limping and loot and man and outlaw. So, of course, it's easier. It just deals with words. But I tell you, it takes you a little bit to understand what the notation is, but eventually you'll understand, oh, so this is how energy works. And then you just plug it into this formula, and it tells you how the energy is related to the structure. I get it. I see how that relationship is. There's, there's a symbolism. There's this kind of a nice package that makes sense of it. But you could spend your lifetime reading Beowulf and its beauty and complexity and not even scratch its surface. You see, math is not designed to deal with hard things. It actually deals with easy things. You know, using math and science, we're able to put a man on the moon. And that's actually the easy stuff. Putting a man on the moon is easy. You know what's hard? Race relations. You know what's hard? Issues of gender. 
You know, it's hard what it means to talk about beauty, what it means to talk about pain and forgiveness and relationships and loss. That's the hard stuff. Dude, math can't handle that. Have you ever had a math class that talk about any of that stuff? Is there a simple equation that tells me what to plug in to know what I need to do to my wife when I can go hang out with her tonight? Should I smile? Should I be happy? Should I bring flowers? I have no idea. It's the hard stuff. There is no quadratic formula for that stuff. It's way too hard. Listen, I'm not looking for answers to math questions, right? That's not what excites I love doing mathematics, but this talk, what excites me about reality is it's not math questions, but I'm looking for answers to the deepest questions. And these questions are the questions that, that you get asked by SC security guards on Saturday night, like at 3 in the morning. Like questions like, who are you? <laughs> That's the question that you get asked. That's the question that I want to know the answer to. And let me tell you, nothing going to help out. But, but here's something interesting, right? Just by you living, just by you existing, just by you hanging out and eating and talking and having friends and having parents and struggling with things, you are already answering these questions whether you think you are or not. Let me, let me give you a picture. So here you are. You have already decided whether you're going to call your mom tonight, you've already decided what kind of a pizza you should have bought a few days ago. You've decided whether you should skip class and go to that concert, do that homework or not, based on some rules. There's a bigger story that's guiding you that you've decided on. Now, maybe the rules that you're playing is the secular humanist rule. Maybe you're an atheist and you say, hey man, that's how I view reality. I'm looking up the hood and that makes sense to me and that's how I'm going to make my life. Maybe you're a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist. Maybe you're a Christian. Maybe you're in this thing. I don't care. I don't even care about any of this stuff. That's cool, but that's still a set of rules you're buying into. Maybe you're in the American buffet rule, which is You'll take a little bit of the Muslim faith, add a little Hinduism, mix it with a little Christian, like, that's what I like. Great. <laughs> Good for you, because that's the set of rules you're playing. We're all playing a set of rules to answer these questions, and we're all answering these questions somehow. Now, to me, the Christian story, this one right here, is the most probable. Now, let me, let me be really careful, right? I don't believe in the Christian faith because it's emotionally satisfying. I'm a mathematician, I have no emotions to satisfy. <laughs> the reason I have faith in quantum mechanics, right? The reason I have faith in quantum mechanics, you know, things, this theory of quantum mechanics, the story of quantum mechanics, the story tells me that there are forces that are there, the strong and the weak forces, there are particles that I can't see, quarks, right? Up and down charges. Somebody's spinning that story for me and telling me, and the reason I drink that story and I buy quantum mechanics. It's because that story explains the physical world in more accuracy than any other story out there. That's why I buy quantum mechanics. Right? Not because quantum mechanics makes me happy, but that's what's the most believable. That's what's the most real. Now, the reason I trust the Christian story is not because it makes me happy, because I think it best explains the world, the way it works. Beauty, justice, brokenness, pain, love, friendship, forgiveness. Now, let me be clear. Let me be clear, right? Here's how much I buy into the Christian story. About 70%. About 75%. If you ask me, like, hey man, how much can you kind of trust into it? Like, out of all the things you know, and of all the things you've seen, like, how much, like, do you think it's going to work? What's the probability that that's the right story? I'm going to say, for me, 70%. 70%, right? But to me, the secular humanist, the atheist story, it's a pretty cool story. It actually makes a lot of sense to me in many ways, but it's about 50%. Right? And then if you ask me, like, how's the Hindu story? It's like, that's quite cool too, but it's about 40%. It kind of goes down. So I have to pick some story, and the best story I got, the one that makes the most sense to me, though it's not 100%, is the Christian faith. It's 70%. That's all I got right now. But the catch is, I got to get on some plane. I got to live my life according to something, and I'm going to pick the best plane I got right now. And that, to me, is the Christian story. Now, the, the flip side is that I'm 100% committed to the Christian story. Although it only is 70% making sense to me, I'm 100% committed, because you've got to live your life on something. And if you don't know what you live your life on, if you don't care, that's still a choice you're making. To me, I'm 100% in on that story. If you can convince me otherwise, I'd love to know. So I just want to close by telling you, what is this Christian viewpoint that I'm kind of into, right? Now, it's not a formula, it's not some abstract truth in written in some golden tablets. To me, to me it, it says that the world is absolutely gorgeous and beautiful. 
but at the same time, the world is broken. There's something wrong. It tells us that God actually pursues us in space and time, in history. God is pursuing us to set the world right, to help us flourish. And that God himself came into the world to do this. He's not doing this work he's straightening up here, but actually down here. Not somehow demanding our obedience, but actually just the opposite. He actually gives us all power. He gives it all up in his own life for the people who hate him. And it also says, my favorite thing, is that one day the world will be fixed. And it's going to be the way it needs to be. Why do I believe this story? Like, why is it so high of a percentage to me? Why is this version of reality making the most sense? Two things. One, I want to close with this. First, it's measurable. To me, I find it measurable. Like, it deals with the Bible, which, which is a bunch of stories. You can actually use literary criticism. You can use issues of literature to see, does it hold? And it actually has these amazing historical things. It says God doesn't talk up here, but he actually comes down in history. So you can try to use history to measure whether that's happening. In fact, the greatest event is the event that today we kind of start the celebration for, which is leading up to Easter, the day that's the punchline of the Christian faith. If that day didn't happen, the resurrection didn't happen, then none of it matters. So somehow you can measure it using historical tools. And finally, to me, the most attractive thing about that Christian faith that, that resonates is, is the notion of the physical. Let me show you a picture. Do you know that we, as a society, are buying more vinyl now? in the history of mine. That's kind of crazy to me, because we now have, unless back then in the 60s where you only had this, we now have lossless digital files. The music you can get now is a lawless perfection you can download digitally, and yet we crave finals because we want to touch the music. <laughs> we have buttons. We want to touch it because we sort of don't buy things that don't have weight to them. We're humans. And if you ask somebody, what do you remember most about college? Very few people will say math lecture. But most people will say, I remember the way the girl smelled. I remember how cool that pizza tasted. I remember how loud the music was when we were listening to that game. We are humans. We want that. You see, the Christian faith is about flesh and blood. It's not about ideas. It's about flesh and blood. It actually says matter matters. God will not destroy this earth, it says, but he'll actually renew it. My favorite thing in the world is ice cream. Jenny's ice cream by far. Incredible. <laughs> and it says, in the new heaven and the new earth, the new place you're going to go, you're going to have more ice cream than you could imagine. That's going to be amazing. It is this story that makes the most sense to me. It explains the reality the best. And I just want to say, happiness just happens to come along. Thank you for your time. Hey everyone. Well, we flipped a coin to see who went first. I wish I had went first because I could have set the bar low. <laughs> not back to follow. But uh, I'll do my best. So I'm really grateful for the chance to spend some time with you today. I'm super grateful to the Veritas teams who brought us all together. I'd like to acknowledge Joe Thackwell, who's our director of Christian Life. He's really the the sort of center of all this. He brought all these stakeholder groups together to make this happen as he does every year. Thank you, Joe. I'm super grateful to our student leaders. Uh, you heard from uh, Quincy and Jazz. I think we're all here to see him, but uh, I'll stand in. So thank you to all of our student leaders who made today um, uh, possible. Very grateful to Karen for moderating it. Um, Thrilled to be on this panel with my Indian brother from another mother. So again, thank you for being here. He drove all the way up from San Diego to be here, and he's going to turn around after this and drive all the way back. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But most of all, most of all, I am grateful to all of you for being here this evening as we collectively ask this question, what is happiness? It's a question that all of us wrestle with throughout our lives. Uh, if we grew up in the United States, especially if we grew up in the United States, I think we're told over and over and over again, from the moment we're born until the moment we die, that happiness is the goal of our lives. That's what matters. We need to be happy. That's what we should be focused on. Uh, if we get the right degree, if we marry the right person, if we have the right job, if we make the right money, if we buy the right stuff, especially if we buy the right stuff, we can be happy. That's what gets us to happiness. And then the assumption there is that 
if somehow we're not feeling happy in any moment of our lives, then something is wrong with us. We're not buying the right stuff, we're not doing the right things, we don't have the right friends, etc. And so I was raised with this narrative. I was born in India, but I spent my, I moved here when I was very, very young, six weeks old. So uh, <laughs> basically what they call ABCD, American born confused Daisy. It's not, it wasn't easy growing up Indian in the United States. We didn't have a lot of role models. We had uh, Deepak Chopra and Apu from The Simpsons. That was about it. So I'm really grateful to Deepak whenever I see him, I thank him. Uh, but I grew up with this idea that happiness was the goal. That's what I needed to focus on. I had to do whatever I could to be happy. And so when I was in college, when I was your age, I embarked upon a spiritual journey to find happiness. As a junior in college, I spent a semester living in a Buddhist monastery in India, where I studied Buddhist philosophy, where I studied scripture, where I began to practice meditation. And it was there that I first encountered Buddha's first noble truth, which is life is suffering, to live is to suffer. And what connects us as human beings is our shared desire to be free from suffering. I struggled with this because I grew up in Newport. I had a pretty beach, but they went, it's not too far from here. I had a pretty idyllic childhood. You know, I used to ditch school and go surfing. And I grew up thinking life isn't suffering. Life is beauty. Life is joy. Life is excitement. Life is inspiration. But what I began to realize is what Buddha was saying isn't that all life is suffering. What he was saying is that if you live, you will suffer. To live is to suffer. And that connects us all as human beings. We all suffer but we don't want to suffer. And so this rocked my world. How can happiness be the goal, I began to think? Or how can happiness even endure if suffering is a fundamental part of the human condition? Where does happiness happen if to live is to suffer? The more time I spent in the monastery, the more I realized that happiness was actually not the goal for me. It was the wrong goal. In fact, in many ways, happiness was a trap. Because happiness, arises and ceases based on the external conditions of the world. Those conditions that are often beyond my control. Someone says something nice, I'm happy. Someone says something mean, I'm unhappy. I get a nice car, I'm happy. I lose that car, I'm unhappy. I get into college, I'm happy. I don't get into college, I'm unhappy. That gatekeepers in the world, that events of the world, that circumstance of the world were dictating my happiness in a way that I couldn't even be sort of proactive with, that I didn't have any agency over. The external conditions were shaping me, that the roller coaster of emotions that I was on weren't of my own making. And that's why happiness is often so fleeting and frustrating. Even our most aspirational document as Americans in the country that puts happiness as the goal in life, our most aspirational document, the Declaration of Independence, doesn't guarantee happiness. All it guarantees is the pursuit of happiness, right? Because happiness is a process more than it is a goal, it's a journey more than it is a destination. The more you grasp it, the more you lose a grip on it, like grains of sand in your palm. The harder you hold it, the less you have. And so after a lot of reflection, a lot of introspection, I realized that I was looking for something beyond happiness. Actually, I was looking for something I could control. I was looking to thrive. I was looking to flourish. I was looking for a sense of belonging. I was looking for meaning and purpose for a plane to get on. I was looking for significance and authenticity, for joy. I was looking for inspiration. I was looking for what Greek, ancient Greek philosophers called eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is a state of human flourishing and peak performance in the art of living. Because with eudaimonia, suffering is part of the equation. If to live is to suffer, we have to build a model where suffering is part of the equation. Suffering can't be the enemy. And when you're not happy and you're suffering, suddenly you feel terrible about yourself. But if to live is to suffer, and if suffering is part of the human condition, then why should it be the enemy? Suffering builds resiliency. It builds empathy. It builds strength. It builds humility. If the goal is only happiness, then there's no room to suffer. There's no room for sadness. There's no room for stillness. And all these emotions and experiences are fundamentally part of the human experience. So. If all we're looking for is happiness, then we're disconnecting ourselves from what it means to be human. This evening we're discussing two questions. What is happiness and what is the good life? I believe these two questions are antithetical to each other. Because in many ways, I believe happiness as a, as a concept, as a theory, as an idea, gets in the way of us living a good life. So if living the good life is the goal, if we're to focus on eudaimonia as opposed to happiness, 
then how do we get there? How do we achieve eudaimonia in our life and in our work? What does spirituality and science tell us about living the good life? The good news here is that over the last 20 years, there's been significant research done on the science of thriving, not just the spirituality, on the science of joy, not just the spirituality, on the science of eudaimonia, the science of living a good life, the science of mindfulness, the science of prayer, the science of gratitude. We suddenly have these sophisticated data sets talking about what religion and spirituality have talked about for thousands of years. And so now, religion and science are in agreement on two core practices that will empower all of us to live a life of thriving and flourishing, a life of eudaimonia. The first practice is to ask yourself the ultimate questions in your life, the questions of meaning and purpose, to find your plane. Who am I? Yeah, the questions of the DPS officer. <laughs> Ooh, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> I work a lot with DPS. I don't think they realize how mystical they are. <laughs> Who am I? What is my role in the world? Not what job do I want to have, but what is my role in the world? What matters to me? Why does it matter to me? How do I translate my values into action? These are the questions that make us human. These are the questions that connect us across space and time with anyone and everyone who's ever lived. To be human is to ask these questions, the questions of meaning and purpose. At USC, you've learned all the right answers. You, you're here because you've had all the right answers. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have all the right answers on all your tests, on all your standardized exams, on all your essay questions to get here. The very act of you being here is a product of you having all the right answers. And when you get leave SC with your great grades and your, to go on to your great life, it's because you're also going to have all the right answers. So, so much of our life is focused on what are the right answers. But what are the right questions? What are the right questions? I believe the very act of asking the questions of meaning and purpose illuminates our spiritual path. That the act of asking the questions, even if we don't know the answers, and the answers might change. Who am I might change when I'm, I hope it does. I hope the answer to who am I changes between the time you're 5 and 10 and 15 and 20. That's what evolution is. That's what growth is. The answers change, but the questions endure. Can we live these questions? Can we breathe these questions? Can we interrogate these questions? For thousands of years, religion has provided us a language and a framework for exploring these ultimate human questions. And in doing so, the world's religions have all situated the quest for meaning and purpose in a larger context. And that context is that we are all part of a reality that is greater than ourselves. There is a we more than there is a me. There is a universe, not just a world. Indeed, by understanding our place in the outer universe, we can begin to explore the depths of our inner universe. And by asking the big questions, we begin to cultivate meaning and purpose in our lives. The act of asking those questions lead us to the plane. The science tells us now, that having a sense of purpose and feeling that we are part of a larger whole is not only good for us personally, but also professionally. Research studies show that people who are purpose-driven are four times more likely to be engaged at work. They're 50% more likely to be a leader at work. They're 60% more likely to have career satisfaction. And they're more likely to have a higher income and net worth. Now, that's not necessarily why you should have purpose, but that's a nice byproduct. That's what we're taught that we want. That's what we're taught we should have. And what we're not taught is that that is the result of asking the big questions in our life. Furthermore, living a purpose-driven life is a strong predictor of happiness, well-being, and a protective factor against depression. And being purpose-driven could theoretically add seven years to your life. There's a physical health consequence to asking these questions, to being purpose-driven, to have meaning in your life, to have something to live for that's greater than you. So according to the spirituality and the science, asking the big questions of meaning and purpose is a necessary precondition for achieving eudaimonia and for flourishing in your life and your career. The second practice for achieving eudaimonia is to cultivate and nurture deep and loving relationships in your life, period. Ultimately, the depth and quality of your loving relationships will determine how you feel about your life. And so the best way for you to thrive is to spend time making meaning and sharing life experiences with the people you love most. In my study of comparative religion, I have found that what religion ultimately teaches us is what it means to be human. And what it means to be human is to look for a tribe and to seek a sense of belonging. It's sometimes hard at a school like this. It's a big school in a big city. 
I feel like so facilitating the kinds of interpersonal relationships that make life worth living. And that's what the science tells us too, not just the spirituality. In the famous Grant study, you probably, you've heard me speak, you've heard me speak about this, sort of a Grant study evangelist. In the famous Grant study, a team of researchers followed more than 200 undergraduate students from Harvard University for 75 years. This started this in the 1930s to determine what conditions lead to human happiness. And given that there were Harvard students in 1935, they were all men, because Harvard wasn't co-ed until almost 100 years after the USC, which was inclusive from its inception, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> Just be happy you're at uh, the USC of the West and not Harvard, the USC of the East. <laughs> so um, what the researchers discovered uh, after following these young men around for 75 years, and they, they measured everything. They measured uh, height, weight, education, degree, salary. They measured um, security, celebrity, status, etc. And what they realized is that the depth of one's loving relationships is the most important factor for thriving. As the lead researcher of the grant study concluded, quote, the 75 years and $20 million expended on the grant study points to a straightforward five-word conclusion Happiness is love, full stop. That's what the Beatles told us more than 50 years ago. All you need is love. And in some way or another, all the world's great religions have embraced this idea as a fundamental truth, that all you really need is love. Another way we can think about the good life is also to think about death, about how do we live life in the face of death. One of the reasons we picked the topic today of hope and healing is because of the immense tragedy we all went through last semester where many of us lost loved ones on our campus. We lost too many students here last semester. How many of you lost someone you knew on campus last semester? You knew someone. Yeah, I mean, the pain is still with so many of us. It, it just doesn't go away. It was, it was really tragic. And I saw students, and I saw myself, really wrestling with the fragility of life, the impermanence of life, and what does it all mean? What does it all mean if any of us can go at any moment? How do we live a life worth living in the face of death? Especially because death is the one truth we have in our life. The one thing I can say about your life is that you are born and you will die. And yet this fundamental truth that all of us sort of uh, will experience is one of the things that we have a real hard time accepting or talking about. And so I began to think a lot about this last semester. How do we live? knowing that our life is impermanent? How do we use the reality, the truth of our own death to achieve the fullness of our own life? And in this, uh, as I was thinking about this, I came across a book by Bronnie Ware. Uh, Bronnie Ware is a palliative care nurse. She worked in hospice care. She worked with patients on their deathbed. For 15 years, she spent time sitting with patients uh, and often had the last conversations with them that they would ever have. She was with her patients during their most vulnerable moment, moments, their most authentic moments, their moments of great clarity when they were looking back upon their life, their most honest moments. Right? And what she realized is that when people are on their deathbed, they have the same five regrets. And so she wrote a book, appropriately titled, Top Five Regrets of the Dying. It's right on point. And my sense is, how we live a good life is we get to the end of our lives without these regrets. Can we get to the end of our lives without these regrets? To me, that's my new definition of living a good life. Because if all of us are going to have these regrets when we're at the end of our life, then we can reverse engineer that and start to live a life where we don't have those regrets. We know that this is what's going to happen, so how can we act now to live a life where it doesn't? The first regret is, I wish I had the courage to be who I wanted to be, not who someone else wanted me to be. And I think this is a great opportunity for you as students. This is an age where you don't have any responsibilities to anyone but yourself. When you're growing up, you were responsible for making your parents happy and your teachers happy. At some point, it'll be your spouse, your children, your employer. You have this sweet window right now between like 18 and 28 where you can just do you. You, know, you can just be you. You can focus on you. It's not selfish to take care of yourself. It's not selfish to try and live your dreams. Right? And now's your time to do it. So I wish I had the courage to be who I wanted to be. That starts now. 
this is the right time for you to have the courage to be who you want to be. You have a safety net. You can throw 10 things to the wall. Three might stick. You might lament the fact that seven didn't stick, but you should really celebrate the three that did. Because you don't know what you want to do until you know what you don't want to do. The second regret, I wish I had the courage to express how I really felt. This, I think, is especially appropriate to your generation, the first digital native generation ever, right? A generation that has grown up comparing your real lives to the Instagram curated lives of others, right? Where everyone's life looks so great, where that avocado taste toast looks so tasty, right? <laughs> but people wear masks in the social media world. That toast isn't that good, and that life isn't that different than yours. And so now is the time to not hide behind those masks, but to have the courage to express how you feel. Number three, I wish I hadn't worked so hard at work. I think maybe they would even say error at school. You know, once again, when people get to the end of their life, they realize that all the time they were spent at working, they weren't spent, it wasn't spent doing other things, it wasn't spent with family, it wasn't spent with friends. There's no one on their deathbed who says, I wish I had spent more time at the office. I wish I had gotten that promotion. I wish I had gotten that A instead of that A minus. I wish I hadn't taken an extra semester. You know, no one. I wish I had graduated a year early. No one says that. Number four, I wish I had kept in touch with my friends. This is tribe. You know, this is tribe. This is what's important. The enduring human relationships. Right now you have the best opportunity for these kinds of relationships. You have the whole world on campus to meet and know and love and grow with. You are, in this room, are many of your future spouses, business partners, colleagues, peers, and best friends. They represent the world. And this is your time to meet them, to grow with them. This is why you're here, to meet each other. You're not going to remember anything that happened in the classroom, certainly not in my classroom, but you will never forget the relationships you had here. And that often happens outside the classroom in Greek life, in residential life, in study abroad, in religious life, in re uh, uh, recreation sports, at the Daily Trojan, in undergraduate student government, within a university framework, but outside the classroom, where you're in relationship with each other. What I want for all of you, really, is not a thousand friends online. I want all of you to feel like you have three friends on campus who have your back. Three friends who you can tell anything to. That's my prayer for you at USC, just three. That's all you need. You can only have 120 meaningful relationships in your life at any given time. So when we get caught up in how many friends we have online, oftentimes we devalue the friends we have in life. And number five, this is an interesting one. I wish I had allowed myself to be happier. So we get back to what is happiness. I think many of us think is happiness is something we are or we're not. Either I'm happy or I'm sad. And that's just it. But what people realize at the end of their life is that happiness isn't what you are or you're not. Happiness is a choice that you make or you don't make. I wish I had allowed myself to be happier. Not I wish I had been happier. That at some point at the end of your life you realize that the barrier to happiness was you. Your own way of seeing the world, your own way of thinking about the world, your own mental conceptions of what was important or not. And so, how do you live a good life? I think you live a good life by getting to the end of your life and not having these regrets. Thank you. To get on this, this path of understanding their individual good lives, like what it takes, what, what practical things would you and what you've done in your life would you give to your you know to the students out here? I bet, you know, I have, uh, I have four kids. The oldest graduated college, he's working in Boston. Isn't that crazy? He must have been like 10. <laughs> <laughs> my second is in college, my third is, in, is a junior in high school, and uh, we adopted this little girl. She's now eight. Uh, she's blonde hair, blue eyes. She's by far my favorite. Um, <laughs> that has its own complexity. We'll talk about that later. Um, but you know, it's the advice I'd give you is sort of the advice I'd give my own kids. And which is destroy your cell phones, <laughs> in all honesty. So I never actually gave any of my kids, my wife and I, until they went off to college. And even after they went to college, we'd have to kind of like have a conversation about whether they really needed it or not. 
And so part of it is because when I grew up as a kid, we're maybe even in high school, like we never had phones, right? Like we never had that technological hit. That means even if I am addicted to my phone, or even if my generation of people are addicted to technological things, I remember times when I didn't have it. Right? I can kind of go back to that bedrock of like, dude, I remember I just took a bike and went to my neighbor's house and pulled it, you know, that I just remember those days, what it meant to have friends. And what it meant to actually knock on a door and be like, I just made some cookies, welcome to the neighborhood. And I was like 12, because my mom was like, get out and do that, right? Like, it's just like, that's part of what you did about being this physical thing. And I can go back to those days, um, even with technology around me. And I just wanted my kids to have that chance. I know that the moment they turned, you know, they go off to college 18, 19, and they all got phones, you know, by the time they were freshmen, uh, their second semester. They're going to learn to use it, and they'll use it for the rest of their lives. I just want to protect them for a little bit for them to kind of grow in a soil without it. So that I'm struggling with that person as a father. I'm messing them up too much by doing those kind of things, um, and how much to push on technology. But that that's what I'm thinking about. For me, I think that uh, what I would say is redefine success. I think we all have a very limited idea of what success is. I was raised in an immigrant family, and success was education, providing for your family, you know, um, and earning a good life, uh, good, good living. And I think that is a good definition of success, but it's very narrow. Uh, if we're going to live a good life, and we know what it takes to, and we know what creates a good life, our relationships, a sense of meaning and purpose, an ethical worldview, a we, not me mentality, a sense of something greater than yourself, right? We know that's what uh, makes a good life. Then why is that not success? Why is friendship not success? Why is it success when you do well in a quiz, but not when you stay up at three in the morning procrastinating before that quiz? To me, that's actually success because you're procrastinating with a friend. You're those are the things you never remember the quiz, but you always remember that conversation. <laughs> why is success not courage? Why is success not bravery? You're all incredibly brave and courageous for leaving home, coming to college, and trying to live your dreams. Why is that not success? Why is success only the things that other people judge us by and not the things that we judge ourselves by? Why is success net worth and not self-worth? Why is success something where I have to jump through everyone else's hoops, but not where I have to jump through my own hoops? Okay? Why is success what other people think about me, but not what I think about myself? So I think we have to expand the definition of success and include failure within that success. When you fail, you fail into success, right? Uh, Thomas Ed Edison uh, invented 10,000 light bulbs that didn't work before he invented one that did. And he said, I didn't fail, I just found 10,000 ways that didn't work first. You know, Michael Jordan said, I missed uh, so many last second shots, I've lost so many games, I've failed over and over again, and that's why I succeed, right? So, all the people who you admire who have had spectacular success have also had spectacular failure. We tend to lionize the success, but that success is not possible without that failure. Once again, this is your time to fail. You have a safety net. If you fail, it means you're outside of your comfort zone. It means you're trying something new. It means you're trying to grow and evolve. That is success in and of itself. Evolution, growth, doing something different, getting outside of your comfort zone. That's why you're in college. Those are the reasons why you're here. So I think we need a larger definition of success that also honors who we are, where we can proactively determine for ourselves what those metrics are, not just sort of outsource that to other people. So I just concur with that in terms of learning how to embrace pain like that. That's something that I personally, you know, worked on in my own life, pain, failure, um, embracing it, not just kind of accepting it, but actually seeing it as value, not um, not something to avoid or or think of that something is wrong with those elements in your life, because it is part of life, just like death is part of life, and embracing it um, or learning how to do that. So. Uh, accepting those things as part of life, and um, so the I guess one more question, Quincy, for the panel, for the, for us, is that one or two? Um, so you mentioned about spirituality, Varun, um, 
and and uh, the purpose that you can find through that, and also uh, relationship as being uh, central. And and I so what would either of you say to those students here who who are uh, not necessarily believers in a spiritual, in any kind of spiritual faith tradition, or, uh, maybe secularist. Um, because I want to, I want to know that this this is something that each one of these students can pursue. So, can you uh, address uh, both of you address? So when I came to USC in two thousand eight, I made a decision, uh, and it's an unusual decision for the university chaplain, um, which is essentially what I am which is not to orient the office of religious life around God, but around meaning and purpose and significance and authenticity and the things that make us human. 45% of you are not affiliated with religion. 45, that's a big number compared to 20% of the American population compared to 2% of you in 1950. So this is the sort of, these are the big demographics uh, trends in American religious life. And so I wanted my office, the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life to be a resource for everyone. For some people, meaning and purpose is found through God, and for some people, it's not. But we're all human, and what's important is that we're on a quest for meaning and purpose. So I tell students, and once again, this might be controversial coming from the university chaplain, that it's okay if you walk away from your religion, your faith. It's okay if you walk away from God. But don't walk away from what it means to be human. It's fine to walk away from your religion, but don't walk away from meaning, purpose, joy, gratitude. Don't walk away from a sense of awe and beauty. Don't walk away from service, transcendence, community, ritual. Have a mythology that you live by. So if you are leaving your faith, what are you replacing it with? And that's what I would challenge students to think about. How are you making meaning in your life? You can make meaning in a lot of different ways. We have a secular student fellowship here on campus. It's one of the most active groups on campus. We have a humanist chaplain. He's a chaplain for our atheists and agnostic students. The most religiously literate people in the United States are actually atheists. Why? Because they've done their research. Whereas if you're born in a faith, you might know a lot about your faith, but not a lot about others. So for me, theistic, not theistic, doesn't really matter. I was raised Hindu, theistic. I studied Buddhism, not theistic. Uh, to, to me, what's important is what it means to be human because religion is fundamentally about what it means to be human. Religion is something that's been, in many ways, created by and consumed by humans, right? It's a language of our humanity, of our shared humanity. And so um, there are a lot of different ways to go about it. And the conceit behind the religion of sports is that, hey, maybe sports can be a place where we find the things that historically religion has given us. Because when I got to the USC, everyone told me, as dean of religious life, you got to know that the real religion here is football, and I'm like, ah, ah, that's really funny, until I went to a game, and I'm like, yeah, that's right, because in, 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 in Trojan football, I found ritual, you kicked the flagpole, I found, you know, a sense of intergenerational experience and wisdom, where grandparents and parents and children were all together, there was a mythology about what it meant to be Trojan, there was agony and ecstasy, people wearing funny costumes and funny hats, there were miracles that were happening on the, on the you know, on the field at any given moment. There was a sense of transcendence and awe. We can find these things in the most unlikely places. We can redefine what we think of as secular as actually being sacred, even if we're not religious, even if we're not theistic. So I would just encourage all of you to own what your truth is. And in doing so, to find a way to make meaning and community, to have transcendence and awe, to think about ritual and mythology, because those are human technologies that have been tried and tested over time. And absent those technologies, sometimes we don't feel fully human. Um, I want to echo uh, some of what Ruben was saying, especially in the words, what it means to be human. But I want to echo it through my lens. So I, I have seen a lot of spiritual life uh, in a lot of different ways, but I want to look at it through the Christian faith. For me, the encouragement that I give kind of this, this bread and butter way of living life, like how do you do it in practical senses? To me, being human is really related to, to your body. That's the only echo I would say. For let, let me tell you background of what's going on. To me, the resurrection of Jesus is the punchline to the faith. And when he came in this new place in the resurrection, he actually didn't come with theological knowledge that we had 
then he actually came and said, hey, do you see my hands and feet? And then in Luke 24, he said, do I need food to eat because I'm hungry? And to me, that resurrection of Jesus, my faith says, that's what the future is going to look like. That's what everything fixed, everything perfect is going to look like. It's going to look like a place where you have a body. So to me, when I hear the words being human, I agree with Bert, but I want it to me, my, my faith would add on to it. Do things with your body. <laughs> Value your body. What I mean by that is grow vegetables. <laughs> Hang out with a farmer. Literally. I mean, like, touch the soil. You know what I did this morning before I came here? Is we have a little garden in the backyard in San Diego, but I, I was pulling potatoes. I'm not sure if you've ever pulled potatoes from the ground. It is my favorite thing to do. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. It is, you just pull it off, and then once you pull it off, you have to then go digging because the potatoes are like, and then you have to kind of like go digging for potatoes. It's like gold. And then if you find one, it's like, this is amazing. I, what it does to you as a human, literally, to use your body if it matters. Let me just give you one thing I'll close out. Any crushed beans, maybe nice beans should cost you a buck. Right? But you're paying like 30 bucks. Why? Because, <laughs> because years ago, we lived in a world where you used your body in three dimensions. And then it became a two-dimensional world. Then the factory came along, and you literally did a one-dimensional movement. And now you sit in front of a computer, transmitting knowledge, and you literally do zero dimension of movement for your body. And your body says, dude, you owe me something. It's like, dude, I got stuff to do, man. You owe me something. Your body keeps telling you, what do you need? Right? What will make you happy? Just <laughs> you owe me a place where you can get out of here, move. You owe me a place where you can hear the noises of other people, great smells, cool conversation. A barista who actually looks at you and says, what's up? Like, you owe me a conversation, you owe me something else. And if it's 30 bucks, you owe me 30 bucks. That's a cheap date, right? Take care of me now and go back to your dumb computer. Just, I am encouraging you, for me, what it means to be a human is actually to value your body. Just look at those things that your body gets excited for. Food, friendships, smells, tastes, all those things. Wonderful. And uh, we'll carry this conversation through you now. So, uh, Quincy, if you want to offer a question personally, which I always think is awesome, but if you have questions that you've done on the Slido, because it's really cool and I've never seen it before, um, you've used it before. Uh, so, anybody have a, a question for? All right, we'll go with the hand. Uh, thank you for the discussion. Uh, my name is Elijah. I'm a freshman here at USC. Uh, you mentioned um, both finding joy and also allowing for happiness. Yeah. Is there any difference between yeah. those two things, in your opinion, and how you would approach it? Thank you. That's a great question. I, I do differentiate between them. I think happiness is the trap, but joy is the goal. For me, joy is enduring. Joy comes from the inside. Joy, you can still have suffering, but still kind of get to joy. It's more of a state of being. Happiness is uh, something that comes and goes based on, in my opinion, the external conditions of the world. Joy is something that endures uh, based on the internal conditions of the world. And my spiritual teacher, who, the man who I got to spend a lot of time with, um, is His Holiness, the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet. I, I got to meet him when I was living in a monastery. I got to host him at camp, on campus two, a few years ago, 2011. Uh, and um, what I've noticed about the Dalai Lama is that he emanates joy, even though he's not always happy. I've seen him cry. I've seen him comfort people who are really broken. Uh, he's over. He's lived most of his life in exile. He's seen a lot of pain and suffering for the Tibetan people. He's carried that burden. I wouldn't say he's happy, but he's joyful. And it comes from within. And his laughter is infectious. And it's not based on something that happens out there. It's based on something that comes from in here. And a few years ago, he wrote a book with uh, Desmond Tutu. Both are Nobel Peace Prize laureates great Buddhist leader, a great Christian leader, and the book was called The Book of Joy. And I think for both of them, that idea of joy, Tutu went through apartheid, he saw great suffering, he wasn't always happy, but he had joy. Same thing with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, he saw great suffering, but he had joy. They were both carrying that joy, not just for them, but for their people, who looked at them for inspiration. And so I do think joy is more of the goal than happiness. It could just be a linguistic distinction that I'm making. Um, we all define these terms in our own way, but that's the differentiation I would make. That's a great question. I just want to echo, I love what Bruno was saying. My, my only echo would be to say that, to me, the joy comes from me. And a lot of the words that Bruno had given us is, is hopeful. In other words, he's saying, if you go through a tough time right now, or if you get that A-minus instead of an A, 
that's the center of it, then, then you get messed up. But if you see the bigger picture of, oh my gosh, this failure is something that's going to give you something else. What is this bigger hope that you have your life set into? Then this happiness will fade in and out, but this joy because of this hope uh, will be more. So I'm just going to say something even though I'm a moderator. <laughs> But that's a question that I had to ask, too. I was going to ask, and I'm so glad you did. And in my preparation for this moderating, I explored a, a, a verse, actually, that I've been struggling with for, for almost a decade. The joy of the Lord is my strength, because um, just for different reasons, joy had sex kind of wasn't feeling. And I was like, what does it mean? What does that verse mean? So for this talk, I looked up. I, I like etymology, etymology, so I looked up the deep meaning of joy in that verse. It was the only time that word, the Hebrew word for joy is used there. And it, it actually, the root of the meaning means to connect. Not like happiness, not blissful, but to connect. And it, it just solved. The question for me is that through my life struggles, through pain, the joy of God connecting to me becomes my strength. That was revolutionary for me, as of yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> okay, am I to read that? Yeah. Okay. Can I just... Sorry. Oh, oops. Okay. Is hell and judgment real in your views? And if so, should avoiding it have some priority for those seeking lasting happiness? Um, hell and judgment. So, in one sense, that my definition of hell is simply um, the place where God isn't there. And so, it, in, in one, I guess it's a, it's a little complicated, but let me kind of unpack it a little bit. But my, my notion of it is God wants us to do exactly what He wants. And if He commands us to do so, then we'll do it. But the cool thing about it is he's given us choices for what he wants us to do. For example, you could say, well, the God, the, that thing of evil that that person did was so evil, I wish you had stepped in and did something. I wish you had actually, like, overrode their power to do that and put your hand in there. Well, eventually, if you kind of trickle that down, you could actually say, well, God, that guy, you know, I was gone, I was gone on 405, and he just cut me off, and I wish you put your hand in there and not let him cut me off. Eventually, where do you stop that thing of, of God allowing you to break in and doing you to actually have choices or not. And the moment you're given choices, then I think we get to a place that, uh, that God allows us to have the freedom to either pick him or not pick him. So that's the big thing. The little thing that I want to say about that is the bonding. The notion to me of, uh, of, this, of this concept of hell is, um, I think to me, the notion to me of this concept of hell is, uh, is that we we have the um, gosh? Let me let me think about this one thing. We have the we have no authority or right to understand what's going to happen in the future, frankly. So what I worry about is when people say, "If you do X, you will go to hell. If you do Y, you won't go to hell." That absolutely worries me because we have no control as to what's going to happen to somebody else. In fact, the Lord of the universe that I know of is so merciful, so gracious, so understanding that he is far more gracious than you could ever be, far more good than you could ever be, far more loving than you could ever be. And the last thing I want to say about this is, to me, this notion of injustice in hell is kind of hard to understand when I'm in San Diego. A friend of mine um, grew up in Serbia. And for him to talk about the notion of justice is one of the easiest things to talk about. He has seen his family slaughtered. And when he thinks of a God who is not going to give us justice, his heart hurts. But for me, to think of a God who's going to give us justice, my heart feels weird. I think God should be loving and merciful. But for him, he's going, but the definition of loving and merciful is somebody who actually sets the world right. For all the injustices that has happened to my family, somebody needs to step in. Who's going to set the world right for him? I find hell a very difficult topic to be talking about in Southern California. But in many parts of the world, hell is a very simple topic to be talking about. 
this dots where their hope is in. Uh, one day the world will be separated. Hell in Southern California is traffic on the 405. I <laughs> and if you find a nice parking spot, it's like a religious experience. Um, I, I, I don't know what happens after we die. So I try to focus on how we live. And I think we can create the conditions of heaven and hell right here on earth. And that's really what I want to focus on. In terms of judgments, I don't want to treat you right. I don't want to treat you with love and compassion because I feel like I'm being judged and that's the motivation. I think there are other reasons we should treat each other with love and compassion. And if there's a judgment, then that's, that's a second order of things. But that, to me, isn't the motivation. So heaven, hell, judgment, these are things that happen after we die. Uh, I think our real gift is to think about how we live and, um, and how we bring heaven to earth. And I find that with a lot of young people, too. Instead of waiting for Judgment Day for justice, instead of waiting for uh, the end of days to get um, some kind of, uh, to, to get to heaven, I find a lot of our younger, especially our younger Christian students, especially our younger Christian activists, want to bring heaven to earth now. It's not about waiting until Judgment Day. It's about creating heaven right here, right now. And, um, and that's a powerful idea for me. I also think that heaven and hell can be a mindset. You know, uh, Sometimes we are living in hell because we're living in our own mind in a particular way. And sometimes we're living in heaven because we have a different kind of mindset. So heaven and hell don't have to be things that happen to you. They can be conditions that you create in your mind and in your world right here, right now. We have, so we have one more. We have one more question. Oh, okay. so, um, this, one, this is fun. This one good. How can all world views, which have fundamentally different truths, all point us to the same love and life? So there's a uh, something we'll know this story growing up in India. There's a famous Indian parable that my grandfather used to tell me about the eight blind men and the elephant, which is that there are eight blind men. They're walking through the forest. They come across an elephant, and they want to think about what is this elephant? What is the nature of the elephant? So one man grabs the tail and says, "Oh, the elephant is like a broom." The other man grabs the uh, tr the tusk. It says, no, the elephant is like stone. And the other man grabs the ear and says, no, the elephant's like leather, etc., etc. Each man touches a different part of the element, elephant, and from their perspective, that is the elephant. The elephant is the tail. The elephant is the tusk. But when they get together and they talk about their experiences, they build a reality that's greater than themselves. And when they get together, they can build the whole elephant in a way that they can't through their individual sort of perspectival lenses. This is the way I kind of feel about religion. Um, I feel that we all have our own perspectives, but the truth is bigger and it can be, and that all perspectives can be true, but the truth is bigger than any one perspective. It's kind of like a dog with physics. You know, can a dog understand physics? I'm not sure. Can we understand ultimate reality? We can understand perspectives of ultimate reality. But the importance of us sitting around and sharing our different perspectives is to great, create a greater whole. Not so that we, uh, um, not so that we negate each other's reality, but that we lift it up in a way that uh, connects it with the other realities around us. And I think that is how we learn. That's how we grow. That's how we build a perspective that's a greater great worldview in a way that gives you a bigger sense of the truth, a bigger slice of the pie. So. I don't think that uh, just because worldviews are different means that they're opposed to each other. We tend to have binary thinking, and especially at the university, right or wrong, black or white, good or bad. But most of the world is not binary. Most of the way we experience life is in the grays, it's in the middle, it's in the multiple perspectives, not in the dual. And for me, just because the religions of the world have different perspectives, that doesn't mean uh, that they're 
contradictory to each other. And I will be the first to admit that me saying this is very much um, reflected in my own Hindu worldview. This is a very Hindu thing that I'm saying. Because I was raised as a Hindu with the idea that there are many paths up the mountain, but they're all going to the same place. Different strokes for different folks, but we're all on the same journey. You might go up the face, you might take the, you know, the, uh, the stairs, you might climb through the side. Whatever your path is, we're all going to that same place. And so there's no right way up the mountain. There are different ways up the mountain. What's important is that we're all focused on the same goals. I agree with a lot of what Bruno says. I, I like his analogy of the elephant. And I actually I really enjoy the fact you said that as a Hindu perspective. In the sense that that's true. I think in many sense we are agreeing. I mean, we're on the stage together, encouraging you to think about these big questions. But at the end of the day, what if the pieces actually are in conflict? Like the, the guys get together, the blind men. And they're like, wait, it doesn't actually fit the other form an elephant, right? Like, what if, what if I'm actually looking at a part of a dog and pulling its tail, and you're actually looking at a part of a cheetah, and like, like what? What do we got? And so, what I mean by that is, the Hindu perspective would say this, but the Christian perspective actually, other perspectives, there are tensions. Like, the Christian perspective does say that Jesus is somehow this ultimate answer to reality, and what happened on Easter is a punchline to everything. If you talk to a Muslim, they they won't agree with that. That is actually wrong. That's not what the Muslim faith would say. It's actually in contradiction to it. So if you put those in the bag and mix it, they don't they don't mix together. And if you talk to a Jew, they would say the same thing. Jesus was not the Messiah at all. In fact, we're looking forward to the Messiah. So there are these tensions. I think there's a lot of tapestry that we can agree on, and I think we are deeply in agreement to say, search for those things, ask these bigger questions, be in community with one another to think about those things. But but I would actually say, when it comes to it, certain things are intention, and, and they don't all fit together so closely. So there are some questions to be resolved and deeper questions to be asked. So I want to just add a little uh, thought that I, I kind of live by this. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a verse in Jeremiah 29, and it, it says, if, if you search for me, it's a Hebrew you know, phrase, but it I think, I believe it applies to humanity, to the human. If you search for me, I will be found by you. If you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you. So, I can agree with both of you. <laughs> you know, the, the good life is about being on the path of searching and continually asking and, uh, the, you know, for what the meaning of life is and what the the meaning of the good life. And I really trust that if you're on that path, if you're searching, he will or she will be found by you. I have no doubt. That's just me. So I think one, one thing that one of my mentors told me when I was your age was uh, you can doubt a creed, but you can't doubt a dance. And that always stuck with me. I think some of the challenge we're having here is just the challenge of language. That when you uh, that when, when you talk about any kind of truth or reality, language itself splits the world up into constituent parts. But when we experience reality, transcendence, God, awe, it's a feeling beyond any words. That's why poetry is so powerful in spiritual, in spiritual language. Because poetry uses words to get beyond words. And so we might disagree on, you know, um, who a particular prophet might be, or what this text say versus what that text say. But I think when we're standing in mysterium tremendum, in the face of ultimate reality, in the face of God, when we're at a point where we're having a human transcendent experience, when we're beyond words, we're all connected. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, language is what is getting in the way of that shared human experience. So I'm going to ask our guests to reflect on one final uh, question I have for each of them. So where do you draw from the well to find your abiding joy that you talked about that transcends? Um, to me, I would, uh, <coughs> having, having thought about 
these struggles and think about these different worldviews the best I can, again, through my moral state, through my lived experience, as we were saying, we are talking about the infinite. Who are we as humans to actually make perfect claims? But the best I have is, uh, and that's also through the lens of mathematics, and what I mean by that is I would love to measure and quantify things. Uh, I just want to know if I can test things, right? I'm, I'm a nerdy scientist, you actually want to test whether something is true. Um, to me, it actually is found in historical evidence. That is what one of my favorite things is about all of this, is that, um, is that at the end of the day, when we have these different notions of who God could be, whether it is a language that's keeping us apart or, or they're not communicating well, I do want to look at history and say, did God actually touch history in certain points? And the biggest encouragement I would ask you to do, going back to searching, is to look at Easter, because it's coming up, and today's kind of the mark of getting ready for it. And uh, just to look at Easter and say, like, are there historical evidences? That is where all my hope is, actually, that one person that I talked about is kind of staked in. To me, that history makes sense. It's something that I can measure the best I can in terms of historical tools. And, uh, and that's where I'm kind of living my life in the sense that, that one day um, God will return <coughs> and set this world right through Jesus. For me, my well um, are my relationships. That's where I draw from. It's, I want to be in the service of my students and of my family, but I realize that, that those are the relationships that nourish me too. That there's almost a selfless act about being a father, being a husband, being a professor, being a chaplain, because I get more from those relationships than they get from me. And so uh, that's where I get nourished. That's where I get, you know, that's where my garden is watered, so to speak. That's the fluoride in my water. That's the nutrient in my soil. That's how my boat is lifted too. So uh, I think that's true for a lot of us, that we draw strength and nourishment through community. It can be religious community, it can be academic community, it can be family, it can be any community that's meaningful to you. But uh, it's important that we have that, that we have community, that we have relationships, that we have people in our lives who are life affirming for us, who give us a sense of hope, who give us a sense of possible. Listen, we all have things that keep us up at night. But what gets us up in the morning? We all need something that gets us up in the morning. And for me, it's you. I think that that is it for this evening. Can we just... tonight's discussion and we hope the Veritas Forum um, that we hosted tonight is relevant and it's respectful, engaging, and thought-provoking for all of y'all. So please take a moment to fill out your survey. So on the Slido option you should have a question and answer tab and the other tab should be a little poll for you to fill out so we can learn more about you. Um, keep in mind we only use your email for one of two options if you would like to plan one of these awesome forums in the future or if you would like to pair up with a coffee chat and I'll explain moment. Um, but before you leave, I have a couple thank yous and one more announcement. I'd like to thank everyone who helped make this night possible. Thank you to Veritas Forum for creating this awesome platform for us and our home team of the USC Office of Religious and Spiritual Life. And special thanks to our Christian Life team for working super hard to put all of this together. Um, just a round of applause for all those Continue the conversation after the event concludes. We walk out of these doors and go about your lives. And the deep questions we asked today was about happiness and what it means to have or live a good life. You should leave the reflection and hopefully discover more about yourselves and others. So in the next week or so, we'll be launching our coffee chat series where those interested will be matched with a peer who has a different worldview. And we'll send you a great conversation starter to help kick things off and maybe a little coffee on us. Uh, so pay attention to your emails and we'll be reaching out to you all. And finally, please join me in once again thanking our lovely speakers tonight and our moderators.